thank you. Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to speak at, at this workshop. And thank you as well for organizing this uh, three-month uh, program. I'm probably one of the people who is taking the most advantage of, of this. So thank you. And uh, so my talk today is um, about the it's about some connections between Bayesian inference and, and convexity, and convex geometry, convex analysis, convex optimization. It's, I will illustrate this through three pieces of work that I <coughs> use mainly as examples of, of this connection. I will not explain any of these three methods in uh, full technical detail but I'll try to give you a very clear idea of the intuition behind them, how they work, what they are useful for, and then there's papers online that describe all the technical details and have more examples and, and derivations of the proofs and all of that. And uh, <coughs> I don't need to cover the three examples, so if uh, you have questions, ask them as soon as you, as you want and we'll, yeah, we'll do as much as we do in the time that we have. Okay, so feel free to interrupt me as, as much as necessary. Um, yeah, and in this talk I'll stay mainly on uh, deterministic algorithms. So if you're interested in my work on Monte Carlo methods, um, I'm not going to talk about that, that today, but I am here and I'm happy to discuss that with you at uh, any other time. Okay, so I'm interested in uh, inverse problems that arise in, arise in imaging sciences. So I don't need to tell you uh, about this, you, most of you either work on this area or have attended hundreds of talks in this area. So I'm interested in estimating some unknown image X that I assume to live in a very large Euclidean space RD. And I don't measure X, I measure Y, which is some quantity that I observe. And I want to recover X from Y. And in order for this to be possible, we need to have some mathematical model relating X and Y. And in this talk, I'll assume that this is a statistical model. Okay, so for example, if <coughs> I'm dealing with a linear observation system of this form and W has some distribution, so I assume that W is some uh, random noise, then this allows me to derive a conditional model of the probability of generating a certain measurement Y when X is the truth. And, okay, so this is, this is standard and in my talk I'll focus mainly on problems where there is a lot of uncertainty about x after observing y. So <coughs> for instance if the operator A has eigenvalues that are very different from each other, very large scale of eigenvalues, or if it's rank deficient then it's not possible to recover x reliably from y unless I regularize the problem in some form. And I'm going to regularize the problem by using a, uh, another statistical model but this time a statistical model on X. So this is a completely Bayesian uh, approach. And um, once I have my prior PX that promotes certain solutions and penalizes other ones, this will reduce the uncertainty about X and um, regularize my estimation problem. And <coughs> we started with this statistical model, Y given X, and this tells you what's the probability of observing a certain Y if the truth is X, this is, of course, not the right way in which we want to write our model. We know why. We have observed why. What we don't know is x. So knowing what's the probability of observing a certain y for a fixed x is not the right thing. What we want is to flip them. So we flip them using Bayes' theorem, as usual, and the object we'll work with is p of x given y. So the posterior distribution of x given y. And this is a model that models my knowledge about x once I have measured y under the assumptions that I'm making by postulating a certain prior distribution <coughs> and giving all these probabilities some analytic uh, form. And I want to, straight right from, uh, to stress right from the beginning that um, when we do this, unless you were in the 1920s, what you're doing is you're operating with subjective probabilities. Uh, Bayesian statisticians, at least the ones that I've encountered so far, never believe that these models are true. So um, often in, in the imaging community we have discussions about whether um, a certain prior is valid or not or, or certain interpretations and <coughs> so I'll straight, stress right from the beginning, none of these models are true, they're all approximations, they don't represent reality when you calculate probabilities, they are not real probabilities, they are subjective representations of unknowns. 
So if you ask me, will it rain tomorrow? I'll say, I don't know, I think it's probability 50%. We're not going to repeat tomorrow a million times and expect that in 50% of the scenarios it will rain. This is just a subjective statement that says that I think with probability 50-50 it will rain. So this is how I read these statistical models, okay? So in this talk, I'll focus on statistical models that are of this form. They are log concave, that means that this function p of x given y as a function of x <coughs> can be written as the exponential of minus some potential function phi, and phi is convex. So that's my only assumption. <coughs> so if you, <coughs> if you find <coughs> yourself in that setting, in an imaging problem, what would you do? Well, what most people do is that they compute the maximum a posteriori estimator of x. And this is <coughs> simply the minimizer of phi. And when phi is a convex function, this can usually be very efficiently computing by using convex optimization algorithms, which have been extensively described in the first workshop and in this workshop uh, again. So there's <coughs> lots of imaging methods that can be cast in this framework. And the reason why we compute this estimator is twofold. One, we observe it gives very good um, res performance results, and two, we can compute it very efficiently. Um, there's a third reason, which is mainly cultural, and which is that most imaging methods are either developed or strongly influenced by people who have a, a training in applied mathematics, and they, are, they find it comfortable to formulate problems as variational problems. So, um, yeah, that means that when we do Bayesian inference, in fact, we are borrowing tools from, um, from applied mathematics that were not designed to do statistical inference. And that is good because we have algorithms that are very fast, much faster than the algorithms that statisticians generally have, but it is uh, bad because we answer problems as if we were applied mathematicians and not necessarily as statisticians. So what are the examples of, of this? Well, for example, we report solutions, but we don't report uncertainty about solutions. That's a big difference between the statistical and the non-statistical approaches to inference problems. <coughs> Another example is that we struggle when our model has other unknowns other than x. If in my imaging problem a was also partially unknown, then suddenly I would start struggling a lot. And there's solutions to that, but they become quite piecemeal, and, and usually the theory starts collapsing little by little. And the third interesting point is that this estimator is not well understood in the statistics sense. So most statistical estimators, in particular Bayesian estimators, are derived from decision theory, and this one uh, is stated algorithmically. So that's a big difference between this and what we usually do when we're doing Bayesian inference. So why do we care in imaging about these limitations? Well, <coughs> because in practice we do need to report uncertainty estimates, and in practice we do need to deal with models that are partially unknown. And, um, and it's good for imaging scientists to understand the theoretical derivation of the estimators. So for example, this is a radio astronomy problem, we don't care about the details, but it's one of these linear inverse problems. <coughs> the operator <coughs> A is a bit complicated. It involves a continuous time Fourier transform and a mask. But the key point is that this operator A is very rank deficient. What I'm doing is, is I'm measuring some Fourier coefficients, but I'm not measuring the entire Fourier plane. So I cannot do an in inverse Fourier transform to recover my image. What I'm doing is I'm measuring some Fourier uh, coefficients along trajectories that are determined by the position of the radio telescopes and the stars, and then when the Earth rotates, it generates trajectories. So I have very little control about what I'm going to measure. I'll measure what I can <coughs> for the time that I have been uh, allocated the radio telescope, and then that's it. And from these Fourier transforms, that the coefficients that don't fill up the entire Fourier space, I need to recover the image. So I cannot do an inverse Fourier transform. What I need to do is regularize my problem. I can regularize it, for instance, by using a simple Bayesian model that promotes um, solutions that have a certain L1 norm on some dictionary psi. 
and if I compute the maximum of this, I get a solution that to radio astronomers looks potentially interesting. In imaging papers, that's typically where we stop. But in radio astronomy, this triggers questions. So one of the questions they'll ask is, the structures that we observe in the background, are they reliable, yes or no? Um, if I want to make a statement about the energy of these structures, can I put error bars on the energy? Can I say that the energy that I measure in the image is plus minus 10% uh, true with some probability? <coughs> in other words, they want to do science with these images. And science requires a level of, of analysis that is more subtle than just reporting a point estimator. So <coughs> what I'll describe today is, are three snapshots of methods that um, I have been developing with different collaborators to address different limitations of imaging uh, methodology, where the key theme is that these methods are derived by exploiting synergies between convexity and, and Bayesian statistics. <clears throat> so the first one is uh, about how to put uncertainty um, information around your maximum a posteriori estimator. So once you've computed the minimum of your cost function, how do you decide what other solutions are also good solutions and what solutions are not good solutions? So for that you need to decide, <coughs> basically, but you need to understand where your solutions live such that you can say, well, with high probability, the true image that generated this data lives in this region. And <coughs> in, in Bayesian statistics, we do that by defining credibility regions, which is the Bayesian name for confidence intervals. And they are regions, C alpha, such that the probability that X lives in C alpha, given the data, is equal to 1 minus alpha. So you decide, I want a region that accumulates 99% of the probability mass, that will give you some part of the parameter space, and any solution that lives in that part of the space is within your confidence interval, which is not an, an interval anymore, it's a region in a space of dimension, I don't know, a million, if you have a thousand times a thousand pixels. So um, there's a million, sorry, there's infinite ways of slicing space to get a region C alpha that accumulates one minus alpha probability. <coughs> but Bayesian statisticians have thought about this and they realize that there's one specific region that called the highest posterior density region which is optimal in the sense of compactness. So they say well from all possible solutions I want the one that is smallest. I want the smallest credible regions and, and they have this expression and they're basically defined as a threshold on the potential function. So, I know that with the lights it's not very easy to see, but let's say that this was my cost function phi, and that I find the minimum here, which is the map estimator. <coughs> what this says is that there is some threshold, gamma of alpha, and that any solution that has a potential that is below that threshold is in your credible region. Okay, so that's how you define a Bayesian credible region in this decision theoretic sense. So if you know that value, then that's it. You have defined your region. So your region is in a very large space, but it's defined just by this scalar value. <coughs> then how you explore this region, that's a separate problem. So if I wanted to estimate this region, what I would need to do is in fact estimate the value gamma of alpha. And I could do this in different ways. I could do this by numerical integration. I could do this by Monte Carlo integration. But it turns out that in, when you have convexity, this is not necessary because there's something quite cute that, that happens. And that means that, and that is that all your probability mass concentrates on, on the surface of a convex set. And, and you see this. <coughs> when you do Monte Carlo integration to estimate um, the quantity, what you see is that if you run a Markov chain that has a invariant distribution P of X given Y, regardless of where you start the chain, you know, that chain generates vectors, each vector is the size of an image, 
after a few iterations, they all converge and start moving around a body. And that's the body of values for which log p of x given y is almost constant. So what I'm plotting here is the value of log, of log p of x at iteration t given y as the number of iterations move forward. And what we see is that although this is a Markov chain, so it's not generating a, a fixed value, it's generating a value that is always moving ar around space and it's dancing around space. If I measure this specific quantity, the value that I get is almost constant, plus minus some very small fluctuations. <coughs> So what that means is that the, the distribution has a typical set. So a typical set is a set where your random variable typically falls. And that set is given by this. So maybe you don't need to do Monte Carlo simulation for these models because even before you conduct the experiment, you already know that most of the probability mass has to stay on the surface of a convex set. And that convex set is essentially the values of x for which the log posterior probability is very close to the entropy of, of x. <coughs> so once you have that, what you can start doing is bounding probabilities. You know that x cannot be very far from this convex set and that allows you to bound probabilities. In particular, you can bound credible regions, which is one specific probability. So we have this, this theorem. It says that if your model is, so if you have a convex problem, that means your posterior is log concave, then um, the region C alpha star that you wanted to find is contained within this approximation C tilde that is identical to C alpha star except for the fact that gamma of alpha has now been replaced by this constant. Sorry, by this quantity. So this is a new value <coughs> that falls a bit above gamma, and I'll call it gamma tilde. And that gamma tilde, you can get it as soon as you've minimized your cost function, and you don't need to do MCMC simulation, because it's given by the cost function at the minimum, so this value, plus a universal constant that depends only on dimension and the value of alpha that you're targeting. So as soon as you have minimized your cost function, you can compute this bound. And if your algorithm stopped early, and you're not here, you're just here, well, then your bound will be a bit worse. But that's all. So numerically, this is straightforward to compute. <coughs> and it has some powerful properties. So because this region gives, is defined with a threshold that is larger than the original one, it defines a conservative approximation. So whenever I do statements such as hypothesis test or, or measure uncertainty, I will never underestimate the uncertainty. So if I reject a solution with respect to the approximation, then I know that I'm also rejecting with the ex respect to the exact model. By the exact model, I mean the equation I started with, which is only exact in that sense. Real images don't come from P of X. <coughs> But that's the operational model we have. And this is a byproduct that you get as soon as you're solving your problem by convex optimization. And the important part, I mean, an important additional result is that this approximation, although conservative, it's never too conservative. So if you look at the difference between gamma of alpha and gamma of alpha tilde, uh, and you normalize by dimension, <coughs> because you know, all these things grow with the number of pixels, the difference between these two will never be larger than just this constant one plus something that dies very quickly. So when you're in large dimensions, essentially your error is always of order one. Your error normalized by the number of pixels. So regardless of how ill-posed your problem was at the beginning, you don't have something that blows up. There is no curse of dimensionality. You know, the approximation remains stable. There's always you know, a bit of extra epsilon here, but that, that's all. And we know exactly what are the bounds. Uh, so we know this is a, these bounds are tight. There's models for which the approximation is exact, and there's models for which the approximation has error exactly one. <coughs> and in large dimensions, that's, that's the best you can get 
having only convexity. And, and once you have these approximations, you can use them in different ways. So one of the things you can do is, so for instance, here we have some radio telescope images. This is the image that you get by just doing the inverse Fourier transform, sort of like a pseudo inverse. The inverse doesn't exist, but you can go for the solution with minimum norm, something like that. So it's a bit like a Wiener deconvolution in this problem. This is what they call the dirty images, and these are the images that you get by computing the map estimator from your Bayesian model. <coughs> and, uh, and once you have that, what you can do is, for instance, do a multi-resolution analysis and at different scales, amplify or attenuate groups of pixels and see how far you can amplify them or attenuate them without going outside of the region. And by doing that, you can measure at different scales in different parts of the image how much uncertainty you have. So you, that's how you can see it visually. So if we do that, what we see is that, for instance, um, around this area and this area, we have very low uncertainty. This is related to the fact that the energy here is very high. And for this problem, regions where you have high energy are, are easy to recover. And then when you go to the background, then you start having more and more uncertainty. And this gives you basically what's the background level of uncertainty. So any structures that are of intensity below that, then you know that essentially you can't trust them. <coughs> I'll talk about how to do this analysis in a more rigorous way, but visually that's how you, you visualize this. And we compared with Monte Carlo integration to get the exact credible intervals. And we observe that the order is of the, I mean, the error is of the order of something percent, something like 3%, 5%, 1%, depending on the data set and, and the problem. But it never gives an answer that is nonsensical. So as soon as you have your map estimator, you can construct a credible region that tells you where the solutions live. And then one of the things you can do is, if there's a structure in the image you care about, you can go there. And for that size of structure, see how much you can amplify or attenuate pixels and get a feel for whether this is a structure that is really in the data or is the structure that um, was maybe uh, hallucinated by your regularizer when it computed the map estimator. <coughs> you can do things that are a bit more um, rigorous than just visualizing uncertainty. You can formulate a Bayesian hypothesis test so this works by splitting the space in two regions. So let's say that this is the space of images and that I want to define two regions in the space. One region would be, I don't know, MRI images that have a tumor in a certain group of pixels. And the other ones are images that don't have tumors in, in that region. So <coughs> I define two regions of space. And those two regions define my two hypotheses. H, H0 would be you know, the set of images for which the structure of, ips, uh, of interest is absent. And H1 would be the opposite. So in this, this is the set of images for which the structure is present. And then what I want to do is compute the null probability or the uh, probability of H0 or H1. <coughs> I want to see if that probability is small enough so that I can reject it. So typically, Let's say I have done a measurement and I observe um, that there is a bottle of water here and then I'm going to test whether you know, the probability of having a bottle of water here is really high or not. So I'll do that either by computing that or by assuming that there is no bottle of water and I'll try to reject it. If I can say that the probability of not having a bottle of water is sufficiently small, that's the same thing as confirming that there is the bottle of water. Okay? Because the true probability is sum up to one. So what I want to do is see if I can reject the null hypothesis, reject that <coughs> there is uh, no object there. So um, I would have to compute the probability of H0 given Y and check if it's smaller than alpha. But this, written in this way, requires integration. For instance, Monte Carlo integration. And I, I will try to avoid that. So because I already have a credible region that I obtained just by using convexity, with, and a quantity that I compute by convex optimization, I'll try to stay within that theme. And <coughs> one way in which I can do that is <coughs> by saying, well, if S is a set that contains all the images of H0, 
and I construct S such that it is convex. Okay, so that's a bit of modeling. You'll have to somehow define a set for which you know, images don't have structure in that area. So I can tell you later offline how, how to do that. Um, if that region S does not intersect our approximation C alpha tilde, then that means that this probability had accumulated less than alpha mass. Why? Because if, let's say, the set of images S that I'm trying to reject lives here and C alpha lives there, they don't intersect and C alpha has probability at least 95%, then this set cannot add up more than 5% because otherwise I would have more than 100% probability and I know this is not true. And if you have model S as a convex set, because C alpha tilde is also a convex set, then all you have to solve is a convex feasibility problem. Basically you need to find out if there exists two points, one that lives in C tilde and one that lives in S, that coincide. If they don't, if you, know, if you, you can't find two points that coincide by solving this minimization problem, then it means these two sets do not touch each other and then you have rejected your hypothesis. If you do find two points that coincide, then you have a nice counterexample. You can say, well, look, um, I have a solution that is quite good. It's not at the minimum, but it's only there, so it's not very far. And it doesn't have a brain tumor. So that means that the structure you are, you are testing is a structure that your posterior distribution cannot quantify with a lot of, of support. It's, there's a bit of evidence, but it's quite weak. There are other solutions that are good, and they don't have the structure you are, you are testing. <coughs> so we apply this to different uh, problems. So this is a simulated MRI image, simulated with an application-specific simulator that is quite realistic and where it is possible to put uh, lesions in specific places. So in this MRI image, if we zoom there, we see there is a bit of a dark region. That dark region, according to my colleagues, represents uh, a brain tumor. And, and then we solve this uh, convex duality problem to see if we find two solutions, one that is good and one that doesn't have a lesion that coincide. And we do. These two solutions are identical. This one has high probability and this one doesn't have a tumor. We basically don't let the solutions uh, modify too much this background by using some linear filters and, and, and constraints. And <coughs> So this is a counterexample. This is a good solution that fits the data quite well. It also fits the regularizer that we used. In this case, it's a form of sparsity in a dictionary. And it uh, doesn't have the lesion. So we conclude that there is not a lot of evidence in the data to support the lesion. And then we have another example. <coughs> we go for another structure. And in this case, we're not able to airbrush the structure, to remove it. We have a set of solutions that will not allow a structure and a set of solutions that stay within C alpha and they don't touch each other. They are quite different. But this one is as close as possible to the set of images that don't have a solution. And the other one is within the sets that don't have solution as close as possible to the good solutions. So if I look at the difference between these two, what I have is in a certain way quantified the minimum signal that the structure needs to have. So I can say that, well, there is a structure there, and if you measure the energy of the structure in the original image, it's maybe 10, and if I measure it here, it's 7, and I can say, well, it looks like with high probability, according to my model, um, the energy has at least 7%, uh, sorry, 7 units of energy with probability 99%. <coughs> and Oh, I had another example where I was doing this for radio astronomy, but I deleted it. Uh, not very smooth. Well, um, so this is one, one example of work where I have spared you the details of how you construct the text, tests, and all that. That's described in the paper, but the main message is that we have circumvented the need to um, do Monte Carlo sampling and um, 
we are staying with the tools that people usually use in the imaging community, things like proximal uh, algorithms, but we are delivering a kind of inference that has been neglected in a certain way in the, in the imaging literature. There are methods to do uncertainty quantification. This is by no means the first one, but <coughs> we hope that because it uses the same tools that people are already using, that it will be a bit more adopted than previous Bayes and uncertainty quantification methods that have stayed in, in the margins of the imaging uh, literature. Okay, and <coughs> I don't have time to cover the two remaining items. I'm going to talk just about this one, and the third one is for uh, next year. So, <coughs> so this is about maximum a posterior estimation and a theoretical derivation of this estimator. So, Bayesian estimators, as I will explain in detail in a minute, they are not stated algorithmically. We don't usually go for an, algorithm, uh, as an estimator by saying it is the point that minimizes this function or is the point that verifies this equation. That's, that's not how we do it. We use decision theory. So that's a big difference between Bayesian estimators and other estimators. Bayesian estimators, they start by saying, um, I want to measure statistical error in this way, and it is defined by a function L that tells you if the truth was X and you report U, you have made an error that is this large. Once you have defined your measure of error, then you, your Bayesian estimator is the estimator that minimizes that error. Now, because you don't know the truth, <coughs> what decision theory says is you need to average over all possible solutions, giving weight to different solutions depending on how likely they are according to your posterior probability. And by doing that, you are summarizing all possible solutions encoded in X given Y with just one solution that is the best representative of all the others in the sense of L. So if L was the mean square error, we know that the best solution to, minimize, to summarize all possible solutions is the mean of the distribution, so the expectation of x given y. This is the minimum mean square solution. And, but you can define other loss functions and define error in a different way. The general desiderata are this. So you want your error to be non-negative. You want it to be zero only if u and x are equal, and then <coughs> Usually, you would rather have something that is strictly convex with respect to the first argument because you want the estimator to be unique. Otherwise, you could have more than one estimator and that makes the problem a bit more difficult. So people steer away of this. We do sometimes work with functions L that are not strictly convex, but when we state the siderata in full generality, we usually add this one to have unicity. <coughs> so the question that I uh, started exploring was whether convexity, because the relationships between the convex geometry of phi and, um, and, and differential geometry, whether you know, we could use the convexity of phi to somehow come out with a notion of distance between the two points and then get a Bayesian estimator in, in that way. And <coughs> so the idea is, well, if x given y is uh, is log concave, there's a convex geometry there. Can we use differential geometry to translate that convexity into a form of distance between x and y or some form of uh, a dissimilarity measure? And in order to do that, what we need to do is define a, a Riemannian manifold uh, and let p of x given y put some geometry in that manifold. So <coughs> we've already had a bit of, uh, of um, Riemannian geometry earlier today. But the basic idea is that a Riemannian manifold is similar to a Euclidean space. However, the notion of norm and, uh, and um, <coughs> an inner product, they are local. So when you're standing at point X, you have one norm and one inner product. And when you move there, you change the norm and the inner product. But they don't change in a crazy way. They have to change in a way that is smooth. But when you're standing on X, at X, you have a certain norm and inner product, and this is what we call the tangent space. So this is an Euclidean space with the local norm and inner product. And when you move, you get a different tangent space, but they have to move smoothly. And 
This is something that is more general than a Euclidean space, but it has a basic element that we need, and that's the capacity to support divergence functions. So divergence functions are any function that verify these three properties. <coughs> they have to be non-negative, they have to be zero only if x is equal to mu, and, and then mu, uh, sorry, with respect to the first argument, it is strongly convex and it's twice differentiable. So in convex analysis, people relax this a little bit, but otherwise that's usually how they define it. And we see that this kind of object from differential geometry is very similar to what Bayesian statisticians use as desiderata for their uh, loss function. So the, conclusion, the logical conclusion would be, well, can I find a divergence that is a good loss function to do Bayesian estimation? And <coughs> the answer is yes. Well, one choice could be the canonical divergence of the manifold, and this is a divergence that fully specifies the geometry of the manifold. So you can define your geometry in two ways, either with a Riemannian metric that tells you what's the inner product at each point in space, or with the divergence function, the canonical divergence function. It is the same. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between the two. So in the interest of time, I will skip some of the mathematical details, but I'll show the three main results. So the first main result is, if your model P of X and Y is log concave, so your potential function is convex, and you assume it is differentiable, the Hessian of your potential function defines a Riemannian matrix. And it turns out that the canonical divergence related to that metric is the Bregman divergence, which is a popular divergence in, in, in optimization. OK, so what would be the Bayesian estimator associated with this divergence, which is the canonical divergence in your parameter space? The answer is it's the map estimator. So the map estimator can be derived from decision theory by looking at the statistical error, you know, this Bregman divergence induced by the model itself. So your model tells you these are the solutions, and then you let the model also decide how to measure estimation error. If you do that, you get the map estimator. And this divergence is not symmetric. So you could look at the dual Bayesian estimator if you flip the arguments. And if you do that, you get the mean square estimator. So the two estimators are related to each other through this uh, nice form of, of duality from the asymmetry of the Bregman divergence. And then once you have this, you can start doing things like analyzing the properties of your Bayesian estimators. And, uh, <coughs> and there's a number of results here. There's just two that I find uh, interesting. So if you look at the um, uh, the error, for instance, in, uh, in with respect to the dual Bregman divergence, which is the canonical divergence measured in the opposite sense, then what you get is that this error, normalized by the number of pixels, is, upper up, is always upper bounded. So if you use these estimators, the error doesn't grow with dimensionality. And, uh, and it, it is the same if you use the Bregman divergence with respect to the prior. Okay. And I'll conclude by uh, saying very briefly what happens when you use this, for instance, in a sparse regression problem. So let's say that I have a, a, a wavelet denoising problem and I have observed an image and I want to denoise it by using a, something that looks a bit like an L1 prior or a Laplace prior on the wavelet coefficients. And so for my theory to apply it, I'm using the Huberized L1, where this, you know, this is differentiable at zero. And <coughs> And what uh, we see is that if we compute the divergences and all of that, what we get is that the map estimator, so the estimator that minimizes this loss, what it's minimizing is a loss that has a quadratic term plus a nonlinear term that we show in the paper is a shrinkage term. So when you are minimizing this statistical error, you are going for a solution that represents your data in a way that is good in a square tuner, in a sort of like quadratic sense, which is what the mean would do, the minimum mean square estimator would do, plus a term that shrinks, a term that promotes coefficients that are close to zero. So when you're using the map estimator with a shrinkage prior, you shrink twice. You shrink once because your prior promotes solutions that are closer to zero, 
and you shrink a second time by using that estimator. So when people use it, for instance, in compressive sensing and you have, they have something that is clearly sparser than a Laplace distribution, one of the reasons why the map estimator behaves well is that the map estimator shrinks twice and it's therefore a lot more robust to the fact that the model does not shrink enough. <coughs> but this is not always true. Sometimes you get models that shrink absolutely fine. Uh, so if I see this for the mean and the map, in this case the map shrinks a lot and the mean doesn't shrink at all. I've designed the experiment to make it clear that now the model is not shrinking, it's just the, est the estimator that is shrinking. But I have examples of just the opposite. Here in radio astronomy, the map and the mean are identical and it's exactly the same model. The A operator is a bit different. But the conclusion is that understanding what's the loss function underpinning your estimator is important because the estimator is essentially summarizing the statistical error in a certain way. If you don't understand how you define statistical error, then you don't really understand why the estimator has these properties. And among other things, we get engaged in very long discussions about whether L1 is Laplace or not Laplace or what is happening. Uh, <coughs> and I think this is an area where we still need to, to analyze the properties a lot further. So I'll conclude with that. And shamelessly advertised that we have uh, four positions in, in Hedyard Watt, permanent positions for anyone from lecturer to professor to emeritus. And uh, if you're interested in, uh, in working in Scotland, uh, get in touch with me and I'll uh, coach you so that you can get hired. Thank you very much. <laughs> <coughs>
Okay. Uh, regarding the Laplace approximation, uh, I, I tried it on, on different problems and I, it's not a tool that I have adopted. Um, so, for instance, in all these models where you don't have differentiability at the maximum, working with a Hessian is, is complicated. But <coughs> so if you, if you have smoothed it a bit, then what I noticed was that working with the diagonal of the Hessian was, was not enough. Um, it was enough to measure the uncertainty at a pixel level, but usually I wanted bigger structures and the bigger structures were not captured by this. Uh, also, it was very difficult to put bounds on the error. With this approach, uh, I don't need to compute a Hessian matrix, I don't need to make any approximation, um, and I get bounds. So that, that's the main advantage. <coughs> okay, thank you. Uh, one more quick question. Okay, so very interesting talk. So, so I think, as, as uh, you know, what, what one of the messages we, we get, like if it's convex, uh, map is not so bad, because you, you know everything, everything you, you, you do is, 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 is kind of based on, on, on the map. Uh, so there were two things. Uh, you flashed pretty fast when, when you were comparing uh, the map and, and, and the, the conditional mean. Yes. So, so, so it was <coughs> not really clear if which one was better uh, 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 visually. Uh, but but okay. then my, my other question is, uh, uh, you know, where, I, I mean, it becomes more interesting when, when it's not convex. So, mm -hmm. so is there any hope? So I can always ask this question. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I'll start by answering that one. So, yeah, so the fact that map works well in, in convex cases is something that empirically has been uh, super validated. It, it was reassuring to have the, some form of Bayesian derivation that did not resort to non-Bayesian arguments. So how come here map is better than Well, it's because, so it's precisely because this is a model where the prior is not shrinking enough. So your real model, let's say your real distribution was generalized Gaussian, and your model is convex and it's not shrinking enough. Because the map estimator shrinks a second time, through this term here that in the paper we show it's not very different from doing an L1 norm um, with respect to U, <coughs> then your map will sparsify the solution a bit more. And sometimes, okay, your model was not shrinking enough, but the map saves it by double shrinking. But in some models, this is not necessary. In some models, all the shrinkage comes from the prior. But, but still like a, an intuition. <coughs> But not when your model is misspecified. When your model is misspecified, let's say the true model needed a certain amount of shrinkage, and I wrote down an equation, and to stay within the convex setting, I didn't shrink enough, because the map shrinks a second time, it, it saves you in that way. Um, but, but somehow, I, I mean, all the people who do MCMC, they're trying to get the, the condition mean, <coughs> or, or let's say confidence interval. Yeah. <laughs> in, yeah, so if your model is convex, then the, the conditional mean is not necessarily the best solution to, to compute. It's optimal in the sense of mean square errors, but it does not save you from the fact that your prior is misspecified. If your prior is misspecified, then you're not that optimal. Okay, thank you. Maybe we will go on this discussion at the break. <laughs>